Okay, first we'll start off like, what is a node? Well, a node is uh, software that downloads a copy of the blockchain, uh, all the history, all the state, all the accounts, transactions, and it keeps uh, that up to date uh, as blocks and transactions take place. And it also helps others uh, run a node. So uh, when you start up a node, you ask all the others for the history of the blockchain. Um, and this is really important um, because the foundation um, of Ethereum is really like a network of decentralized nodes. And uh, without those, you know, it, uh, um, you know, why are we here? I, I guess we could just build a centralized solution and um, have something quicker and um, yeah. So we'll go over four, four of, of like the main um, reasons why I tell people like, hey, you should run a node. So uh, again, supporting the network, it's each additional node that joins is additional capacity to the network. Uh, it makes the network more robust, uh, more secure. Uh, again, more no like easier for a new node to start up as more nodes to, to get the uh, history from. Also, it's really important that we have people running uh, nodes that are from different clients, meaning different uh, node teams, different client teams. Um, right now, it's kind of a big problem. Um, if you've heard of Geth or Go, Ether Go Ethereum, right now about 80% of nodes are Geth. And if there were to be a bug in Geth, uh, that would cause quite a problem for the network. Um, so we'd much like to have users run like Besu or Nethermind. Um, and uh, yeah, this makes Ethereum much more resistant. And I'm sure it helps the Geth developers sleep at night as well. Okay, another big reason is to avoid lock-in. Um, this has to do with like the problems of kind of the Web 2 that we talk about a lot, centralization. Um, so uh, having a decentralized network of nodes both helps Ethereum from being uh, kind of like uh, locked into maybe a small group of developers or teams. And it also, um, it enables like uh, uh, additional systems to be built on top of Ethereum and um, have these properties. So uh, if you, you can build a system on top of Ethereum and uh, if designed in the right way, uh, a property can only really be changed if uh, all, the other, all the users and participants want that property to be changed. Um, we, when we talk about forkability, this is what we mean. Uh, one other cool thing is, kind of relates to the last slide, is uh, you get to vote on uh, changes to Ethereum if you run a node. Uh, so let's say Vitalik and some of his friends create an update to Geth and say, uh, we want one ETH every block, and we're going to send it to devs.eth, devs .eth, um, and they all update their nodes. Uh, you can choose to support them um, by taking that update, essentially voting uh, with their change, or you can decide not to, and you can not take that update and just run the, the current version that you're running. Um, so if a lot of users don't update their nodes, if uh, the, the like centralized exchanges and your wallet providers, like they don't update their, update their nodes, then this update doesn't take place. Um, but let's say like all of those actors do update, um, then it's most likely that this update goes through. And if you don't have a node, then you don't really have a choice. You don't have a vote. You don't have a voice. Okay. And uh, this is a picture from one of Vitalik's blogs. Uh, again, talking about, uh, uh, yeah, so um, if there were to be some sort of attack on the, on the uh, Ethereum through this, uh, like a new update comes in and it's does something bad. It takes funds um, that would be considered uh, like the attack we're talking about here. And uh, all the users, all the node operators that decide to take that uh, contentious update, they they may end up on one fork, and all the other um, users and node operators might end up on another fork. Uh, and he talks about. Uh, these are kind of like the three scenarios that would happen in this case. And uh, so 
we prefer the options like toward the left. So we would want something like this to fail, obviously. And uh, however, uh, even if it just ends up in chaos, meaning like, uh, you know, maybe half the exchanges show one state of the Ethereum and maybe half the, you know, exchanges and wallets show another state of Ethereum, that's still like much better than uh, the attackers uh, becoming victorious. Um, it kind of makes the attack like extremely expensive, even if the attack doesn't, uh, you know, isn't victorious or is, doesn't fail, I should say, it's still extremely costly. All right, and then an important question everyone wants to know is, can I run a full node? Um, a lot of people I, I talk to, they want to run a node, but they don't know if they can. So here are some of the requirements. Um, your computer needs eight to 16 gigabytes of memory, two terabytes of fast SSD storage. That's, this is kind of the biggest problem for people is, is this fast SSD storage. Um, even some of like what you might think is like a really fast external storage drive, like, uh, you know, it's super highly rated for like moving videos and in photos. It might not be fast enough for syncing a node. Um, let's see. Uh, right now only one terabyte is used by nodes to store the state. Um, this is growing about 10 gigabytes per week. Uh, some nodes have options to use less. Uh, they're kind of, ex um, they're just beyond like the experimental phase. They're like they're solid options, but they have their limitations um, and don't quite maybe meet all of the uh, use cases that people need. And then the CPU is not usually a bottleneck, so um, most laptops that are within like five years old should should do fine. One second. Internet can be a little bit of an issue, so you need about 10 megabits upload download, and it needs to be lower latency connection. Um, the data cap is can be a problem in the US. Uh, a lot of internet providers have a one terabyte per month cap. I've talked to some people uh, here in South America, and they don't seem to have that problem, or at least they're not aware of it. And then definitely can't really run it on like a slow cellular or Wi-Fi connection. Okay, I'm gonna quickly talk about like the SSD types. Um, kind of the number that you wanna know is this like 10, 10K input output operations per second. Um, so yeah, nodes, uh, they are essentially writing like tons of like small files back and forth, reading and writing to uh, the SSD. And um, this is kind of like not really a common rating that uh, SSD companies tell consumers. Um, because it's not quite ap applicable to what most consumers are doing with their SSD. Uh, most consumers are just, yeah, like moving a large video file, storing photos. Okay, um, internal SSDs, M2, NVMe, uh, that's like very popular now. Um, within the like $200 range you can get uh, for this. Um, and then, yeah, you probably just want to stick with that. The other options, if you have them like lying around, those might work. That's not going to work. Uh, external SSDs. Uh, the reason why, like, I, I, I want to emphasize this is because I think there's a lot of people out there with laptops uh, and don't have like a dedicated desktop or a computer just for running a full node. And so, um, I want people to be able to run a full node on their laptop maybe like while they're not using it or if they have an extra one. Um, so check to see if your laptop has like one of these uh, connections, uh, either Thunderbolt 4 or 3 or USB 3.2. Okay, now this is an interesting part because these are some of the upgrades or potential upgrades coming to Ethereum in the near future here. So when you hear pro dank sharding, that's EIP 4488. Um, and actually in the worst case scenario, this would add two and a half gigabyte, uh, terabytes per year for node operators, which is just not really an option for at, a, at home node operators. So um, in one of Vitalik's write-ups, he said that like, uh, when, like if proto dank sharding goes through, like we also need EIP, all the fours, 
And uh, what that does is eliminate historical data requirement from the nodes, which would save like 500 gigabytes. And, um, um, and kind of like cut down the requirement on nodes having to store like all, all of this data. Um, state expiry is one that uh, is, is contentious again. What it does is essentially eliminates the requirement for nodes to like uh, keep on to certain, to, to store certain transactions. Um, let's say like before a year or so and um, unless that state is updated. So uh, I, I have a feeling this probably won't go through. Um, so don't count on that. Uh, stateless Ethereum is, is a really cool change. Uh, no storage would be required for the node, so it would pretty much eliminate that two terabyte SSD requirement. Um, it would still be good for no, for like some nodes, some users to have that block, that history, but it wouldn't be a requirement. So you could run a node and still validate all the blocks and transactions and, and really um, participate in all those benefits I mentioned earlier without the storage. But again, this requires like Verkle trees and is a pretty difficult upgrade. So don't quite count on that. Uh, Ethereum portal network is a really cool, uh, actually like separate network, separate network built on top of Ethereum or to the side of Ethereum. Um, it leverages like BitTorrent um, architecture and would kind of enable everyone to run a light node actually like embedded in their wallet. Um, so like most of our wallets right now, they talk to like Infura or Alchemy uh, to get transit to get transaction and send a transaction. Uh, this would essentially eliminate that point of, point of centralization and uh, your light node would actually talk to other light nodes, which would uh, talk to full nodes whenever you send a transaction. So we really promising, but uh, quite a bit of work there. Um, I think they want to have just for a time reference, I think they want to have something out by like the end of next year. Um, all right, the fun part, how to run a node. Okay, uh, could I get a quick uh, hands, like if you've heard of DAP node or uh, Ethereum on ARM, I guess? Maybe a quarter of the people in here. Okay, so yeah, they're great. The only um, difficulty with running a node with that node is you pretty much need a separate computer. Um, it installs an entire new operating system, which is also um, can be a hurdle for people that haven't installed a new new operating system on a computer. Um, but they're great. They've been around been around for a while, and um, I would say like are pretty battle tested. Option two is the command line, which uh, is for, you know, super technical users um, uh, and yeah, technical users who are familiar with the command line and um, yeah, don't mind monitoring their node from a flurry of like command logs. Um, and then this is this is actually from Ethereum.org's website, <laughs> um, and I actually photoshopped nice node here, like, or not photoshopped, but like edited the HTML. So this was kind of like uh, the vision for nice node um, was like, hey, we, I think we need a third option, one that is uh, for like the non-technical user. There's tons of people passionate in the Ethereum community uh, who want to run a full node, but don't want to hit the command line, don't want to buy another computer. Technically, it's possible to just download an app on your laptop and run a full node. So why don't we have it? Uh, so I'm hoping someday uh, when this gets to a, a more stable version that they'll include me on, on ethereum.org, but uh, we got to prove it until then. So I'm going to talk about a, a nice node, which uh, I am working on. And um, so this is what the current version looks like. This is our alpha release version zero. And you can see this is just like an app running on, I think this is Windows. Um, and you've got both your execution consensus clients here. Um, super simple, stop, start, uh, remove. You can kind of see like, what is it doing here at the top? Like 
okay, awesome. I know how much storage it's taking up. I can see like what's the latest block it's at. at it's at uh, how many peers is my node connected to? And then um, kind of in line with this idea that like I want everyone to be able to run a node. I also want everyone to be able to like you know no matter what language you speak, um, we'll have a translation for that language. Um, and all of these languages uh, were translated by contributors, just people with a good heart who came out and said, yeah, I'll, I'll be glad to translate like whatever we can and into another language. So uh, nice node essentially supports translations. We just need people who speak all of the other languages to help out. Um, Okay, hopefully this loads. So this is a design for our next version, much like cleaner UI. Um, at first, only the Ethereum node will be available, but I'm designing it to be general so that uh, you can run other nodes. I'll, I'll talk more on that. Um, so you pick Ethereum node, then you pick uh, which client you wanna run. We conveniently show you which clients are minority clients. Um, you can select a few options, select where you wanna store the data at. Again, these are all things you'd have to do from the command line. Um, and then this uh, will actually take the screen. Um, I, I think I'll show it to you later. Um, and then we have to install some dis dependencies here. And we just hit start. And um, our node is syncing and running. and. We have this beautiful UI to see our node and uh, everything's great. Okay, so this, was, this is kind of a key um, piece of information for a lot of people is like, can my computer run this node? Um, no, you don't have to go to like guides or websites to read through things. It's in the app. Uh, the app, yeah, we can see like, hey, is your CPU fast enough? How much memory do you have? Do you have an SSD? Does it have enough space? All of that stuff. Um, we can do, so we do it for you. And th this may differ by client, um, and in the future, this may differ by node type, uh, meaning the hardware requirements may differ. Um, some nodes maybe use a smaller amount of RAM, um, others you might use more storage. Um, so we'll give you that green check mark if you're good to go based on the node type. Okay, a few more screenshots here. Um, yeah, just wanted to leave these up here so you, you could see them without the video. Um, this is this is really like important to me, um, being able to change the settings on your node through the UI. Again, um, to do this now, uh, you have to go to the docs of the client team, uh, try to find like the right flag with like the dash dash, uh, whatever, and hopefully you format it rightly. I don't know if it needs quotes. Uh, does it need a comma in between or a space? You don't have to do that. With nice node, it's here. Um, yes. Okay, nice node is cross-platform, meaning it works with Windows, Mac, Linux. Um, this is a screenshot of Windows. Looks like it's not gonna play. Um, so, yeah, again, I, I designed nice node to be as general as possible, meaning um, as L2s start to decentralize and provide nodes, um, maybe sequence, sequencers, um, nice node, uh, there should be very minimal changes to support those new node types. Um, and, uh, and actually, like, users could open a pull request to nice nodes GitHub, and, and those new nodes would be in, in nice node in the next release. Um, so uh, for the technical folks, nice node is sort of a, a UI wrapper around like Docker containers. Um, so any, any node type that has a Docker image will be like really quick, really easy to add to nice node. Um, and, uh, yeah, eventually we want to add, uh, things like staking as well. Um, so this is a UI screenshot of like what it would look like if you were to add, uh, validators. Um, and then you can just kind of see like... Yeah, uh, Arbitrum does have a have a node out. Uh, I don't know if um, I don't know how involved it is in their their layer two yet. I think it might kind of just be like a replica node and not quite 
the same priority as as um, they're kind of like uh, their own. And then the and, and beyond here is okay. If our if our like Web three dreams take off and Web three infrastructure is really where we go to, and the users control we control the platform, we control the data, then we're going to want users to run uh, some of these Web three infrastructure nodes. Um, so for example, like this video is being live streamed over LivePeer, and uh, they have a uh, network of video trans transcoders. Um, and then, uh, so they transcode this video, and uh, that's that. Any any one of us, if, if you have a graphics card, can join that live peer network, and um, uh, we can use our graphics card to right transcode that video. Um, so this is just one example of, yeah, like a Web three um, infrastructure that users can participate in and, uh, and and have more of a say in, and it's something that. Uh, I think we can support, and uh, so we show it here. Okay, and this, I think this might be the same video. Okay, and that looks like the same screenshot. Maybe I hit it back last time. Okay, a little bit for our roadmap. Um, so we're really close to releasing uh, the redesigned UI UX uh, and the super simple onboarding, walking you through like the hardware requirements, other things like that. Um, I wanna get more translations. Um, we're, we're, um, we're gonna work on that hard, push on that hard, hopefully by the end of October here. Um, after that, there's some internal changes that we need to make to support more node types for the future. Um, for the Technical folks, so that's uh, Docker Compose. That means kind of like there are nodes that have contain multiple services, um, and so that that will help those node types. Um, and then additional features. Uh, I, th I think I can show you these after. Um, so yeah, node notifications. Uh, if your node has an error log, like we'll we'll show you a notification. That error log won't get like lost in your terminal, and you'll never know about it. Um, and then you can like search logs. Um, maybe if your internet goes down, we'll notify you um, that your internet was down for a brief time. Um, and then after that, yeah, by February of next year, we'd like to add uh, layer two nodes and more Web3 infrastructure nodes. All right, so it's it is critical to Ethereum's mission of decentralization, censorship resistance, and resiliency for users to be able to run nodes. And um, this is this is extremely important to me because, like all of the other good things we talk about here, um, you know, will only last, will only exist, will only really be possible if uh, we have a truly like user-led um, uh, culture of like running nodes, and um, if. The core devs continue to make it possible for users to run nodes. So, yeah, for like, if we want this dream of like open global infrastructure, super low transaction fees for the world, like open financial system, um, Ethereum for everyone, we need uh, users to continue to run nodes. And nice node's mission is to simplify node running. And thank you. Gracias a todos. So, yeah, I want to open it for questions. And um, uh, let's see. I just want to move it to this slide. Uh, so, yeah, real quick, if you want to help, uh, we need everybody um, join our Discord, reach out on Twitter. Um, there's a website here you can translate on, uh, which uh, I'll get notified as soon as someone translates. Um, so that's cool, too. And yeah, question time. Uh, thank you for your time, first of all, and presentation. I've got this core philosophical question that I've had for a long time, which is I feel, and maybe this is a lack of understanding, that full non validating nodes are overvalued because, in the end, the state is really managed by full validating nodes. So, why does it really matter that there are more and more 
uh, non-validating nodes in the network? What does it matter so much? And isn't it easy for some big entity or, or to, to just deploy thousands of full non-validating nodes which don't need to stay key uh, to overpower, to kind of cyber attack the non-validating network? Okay, so, so um, tell me if I understood your question right. So your question is, What's the importance of uh, non-staking, um, non non-validator nodes like without ETH? Um, what's what's their importance? Um, yeah, why, is it stressed, why is it stressed so much? Let's keep the requirements low so that, it, so that anybody can run on uh, when I don't really see the... Yeah, yeah so uh, it's a great question. And um, what it does is uh, the non-ETH, non-staking nodes actually keep the validators. It keeps the ETH stake nodes honest. So yeah, if let's say um, some centralized staking service gets yeah 75% of the validators um, and they want to push through a block that sends all the ETH to them, uh, the non-ETH uh, nodes will say, hey, that's like that's a funky block that doesn't apply, that doesn't uh, follow the rules of Ethereum. That's, you're trying to steal someone's money. Reject that block. I'm not like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna take that transaction and share it with anyone else. I'm gonna drop it and say that's invalid. So it essentially keeps them honest. That, that makes a lot of sense, but is it still easy to overpower since you don't need an ETH requirement? Like the, the monetary premium on, on cycle attacking the network is really low. Like if right now you have 10,000, non-validator nodes. To push another 10,000 into the network is very easy economically. So how, how strong really is the, is the defense mechanism? Yeah, that's that's a good question. So, like, if someone were to on a some cloud service just spin up like a ton of non ETH nodes, um, I think it would be I think it would probably be more costly than um, it would be. I think it still would be pretty costly. Um, and I think even if let's say they have triple, quadruple the number of like honest, nice nodes, uh, then. That I think the attack would still fail, or it, it may, in this case, uh, default to chaos. So I think it, it, I'm probably not the best person to speak on terms of like, hey, we need X number of honest nodes. But I think um, a sufficiently, so, so right now I think it's, it's at about like 8,000. And um, yeah, I don't know what that right number is. I, I, I was reading one of Italic's blog and I think he even said, I'm not sure how many it is. It's Probably more than like a few hundred, but I don't. He, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. I'm not the best person. I hope the uh, court has thought about that. Okay. Uh, you talked about adding validators um, to nice node. Yeah. Um, and you also talked about making it very simple for people that run on the Windows computer that don't have very much tech experience. It's you know, my, my father could run it, my mother could run it in their home. They don't do anything to tech. Um, so if they get all this set up and I show them what Ethereum is and they put all this money into it, now they have this money running on this Windows computer there and it has no battery backup, it has no, um, they just shut it down because they, they don't want it running all night. Well, obviously now they're getting slashed and so you have a lot of these people who don't know about these things, you know how to set up the, the hardware, aren't you kind of concerned about that? Or maybe they think, I want to set up two. They use the same contract addresses. They set up two, and boom, 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 they start getting slashed because you can't have two. Um, have you thought of, uh, like, four people get into this? Like yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Is like, if we do make it easy to use, like, we need to um, also make make it very clear, like, what they need to do. And, um, and then probably also make it very easy for them to... Uh, like stop it or withdraw or um, notif notify them. Um, so yeah, if we're going to make it easy for people to onboard, we also need it. That's a great point. We need to make it easy for them to kind of get off or help them get off. You mentioned, you know, hopefully it comes on the Ethereum's website later. Like you edit the HTML and put it there. Yeah. I would think that would be one of the tenders where they say, well, how responsible are they? It's like nice to know the responsibility to do that. Yeah, I think the quick answer is I would, um, in the app, we're going to just make it like 
super obvious, super, like lots of warnings, like, hey, this need, you, you need to have your internet on, you need to have this computer up. Um, and yeah, ho hopefully it's a, our solution is a lot better than the alternatives. Like hopefully we're way better at notifying people um, when their node does go down, things like that. Yeah, no, no, no incentives right now yeah. for for a non eth non validator node. Yeah. So uh, and and that's a great point. Like, if um, if you're someone who um, like the SSD is like a big uh, commitment uh, for you or purchase, like maybe running a, a full node. I don't want to discourage you, but maybe it's not the best use of of like your money or resources. Like the, there are, there is no like direct incentive at the moment other than obviously like making sure ethereum um works and stays up so um it is yeah that's a that's a great uh, point mm -hmm. yep yeah, i had a question that's pretty related to what you have said like uh, it's from personal experience like when the vpn just launched i was also one of the first uh, and i'm not a very really technical guy so i just want to be all the recommend my and I ended up uh, using that node. And the onboarding was pretty good, but then over the months, like, it was pretty high maintenance. Like, if you have a client update, mm -hmm. the update, and then something breaks, it's really easy to get into it, or like spin up the load and come down to fix it. It's really hard to keep up. So I guess it's not really a question, but I think it's more of a challenge. Like, how do you build a you know, one big solution for creating one competitor? Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly we want to make it as user friendly as possible. And uh, we, you know, one thing we have uh, thought about is like letting users opt in to automatic updates for their nodes. So um, wherever possible, they don't need to need to do anything. Um, and I think that yeah, that's that's probably a big part of of running your node is yeah, just doing those updates and then having some sort of like alerting. Um, in terms of like if some some other problem were to happen, like we would try to diagnose it as best we can. But um, I suppose that uh, like for an issue we can't diagnose. I yeah, I don't have an answer. <laughs> but it's it's something I'll definitely um, uh, keep in mind. Yeah. Maybe it's possible to have some kind of way that you can yeah, I don't know, get access to some kind of command uh, line interface and have a, a technical friend to do some debugging. Okay. Basically, yeah, certain kind of UI itself. Yeah. 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 The other the other thing I do want to have is like if uh, I'll like show the command that nice node used to start the node, so you can just copy and paste that command and like leave the app if you want, and then you can just go to the command line and okay. yeah, that's that's something I want to do too. Right here. Very good. Uh, first of all, uh, congratulations. Uh, really like the, the new UI that will come. Thank you so much. Uh, I have a question which, uh, regarding all, the, all, all these challenges. It's based on like, uh, how to get people that non technical people into, into this uh, ecosystem, right? So I really like to uh, see this kind of like UI that's guiding to you and trying to get in this with uh, basically not everyone, right? Uh, to say like, uh, how to build a one click application. My question is, uh, when, when your team like a build this, it's, it's based on like a, there is a research behind like a, for what kind of age or, or what, what is the, um, this kind of people that can afford like a, this is easy to use because even if this is easy to use for us, maybe that kind of steps and select, op select option and all the stuff will be tough for uh, an elder person or even a young people. Like, there is a research behind that. like. A, this is like uh, accurate for this uh, age people or non technical people, whatever. Okay, so um, just to repeat uh, for the, the stream, um, it sounds like there's concerns that uh, we need to make sure that uh, if it is super easy to get in to, to get started, that uh, we make either some guide rails or some some um, just make it to the user aware that what they're getting into and. Um, so yeah, I mean, what, what I'd have to say to those concerns is, um, 
I think we, we could do something where um, in, instead of letting like the user, this is just something I thought of now, like click like yes, 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 and then they're good to go, like deposit. Maybe having some kind of like um, speed bump kind of thing where like they have to either like demonstrate some technical uh, um, knowledge of like what they're getting in, getting into, just sort of sort of like maybe basic quiz or something like that. Um, but other than that, I mean, um, yeah, d did I did I um, address your concerns? I, was there anything else or? Um, no, okay. Yeah, I think maybe some sort of speed bump just so they can't click through like super fast and, and get themselves into something they didn't uh, know. And now this program is taking up all their SSD space in the background. Um, yeah, absolutely. Right there in the white uh, sweater. Uh, or, yeah, I think you were first, Bob. Blue shirt. <laughs> uh, sorry if you've already heard this before, but what's the difference between slashing with a regular node and using nice node? Um, so if um, if you don't have any ETH and you're not staking, no slashing. Um, if if you're staking with nice node and uh, your node were to go down, it would be slashed just like an, any other node. That's that's a great question. Um, his question was, could this be a web app? And um, in, I, I, I don't think so as of now. I think uh, I, uh, I think there are limitations on the browser, which you can't basically run a command. Uh, a web page can't just like run an arbitrary command on your your computer, but it, like an installed application can. Um, so. Um, now the front end part of nice node we could separate that out and put that as a web page um it's actually uh it's actually like mostly the front end is basically a web page it's basically running in um chromium there's uh the underlying architecture for nice node is called electron and it basically downloads chromium and so it's it's like its own little web browser there with extra permissions to uh, interface with the operating system Any other questions? Okay, here again. How does, how does nice make money as a uh, right now, uh, no plans. I want to stay open sources as, as long as possible. Uh, we've been supported by uh, first East Staker in a CR, CLR fund, um, and then Getcoin, um, two rounds of, of Getcoin. And then uh, re we recently got a grant from CityDAO, which funded the like improved onboarding experience that I showed you all today. Um, and then hopefully, hopefully we'll get more grants and stay open source. Yep. I've seen people ask that. Um, I think if there, there could be in the future, and I, th I think absolutely, I think uh, there are lots of um, groups or foundations, um, maybe like ETH Staker or the Ethereum Foundation, who would um, provide some incentive. I think the limitation here is probably like you need to prove that the person running the node is a human or that proof of humanity civil civil resistance problem. So um, I haven't thought through the whole like uh, consequences of tying your proof of humanity ID to your node, but I think with that, people would give out incentives. Um, other than that, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how they would do it without civil resistance. Yeah. Uh, if you're not staking or not validating, there are no no incentives, no yeah, no monetary rewards. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's something I've thought about. Uh, I haven't like quite worked on now, but uh, the operating like w the app can know whether you're on battery, whether you're on power, whether you're on Wi Fi, Ethernet. Um, 
uh, right now we don't have like any internet speed check, but that's something we could definitely add. So I want I, I, I to, in the long term, I do want to make it so that, yeah, you can close your laptop lid, the node stops peacefully, wherever you go next, you open your laptop, maybe just plug it in, you eat dinner and it's, it's syncing like while you're, uh, yeah. And then while also potentially like you get, we could have a setting like while you're, while I'm working, don't use resources, like just run in the background or like just pause while I'm working, maybe from my typical work hours. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Anyone else? Okay. I think that's it. I posted the slides on the nice note Twitter. Um, there's tons of links in here. Um, so uh, you can check out the slides there. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. And uh, gracias los organizadores y uh, al equipo y a todos. Uh, okay, that's it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>